So I, I would like to start with the first question. And you mentioned that you partnered with the School of Business and the School of Communications. And you, there were students that were training alongside the NP students, or how did that work? That's correct. We have uh, the curriculum is embedded in the, the School of Business curriculum, in the DNP curriculum, and then in the curriculum for the Department of Communication Studies. We also had three teams that we used to help create this clinic. One was the advisory team, which included community partners and leaders at THA and, and, and some key faculty. But we developed a practice team. Like, we don't know how to birth no clinic. And so what we did is we tried to bring some people together to help us start from scratch. We, we knew nothing about EMR. We needed to figure out how to buy equipment. How many speculums do you need in a primary care clinic that has three rooms. It really was that basic. We also had a school of business student who was helping us create a pro forma and a business plan. We had uh, communication students who were helping us create health literacy opportunities for the patients to be seen there. And then the DNP students, uh, along with uh, NP faculty, really worked through the step-by-step -step process to figure out how to build a clinic. And then, of course, we had the curriculum team that had students uh, from, from all three departments. So I'd like to open the floor for questions and comments for the next 10 to 15 minutes for Shirley, and then we'll open up um, for the entire panel. Stephen. Thank you, Shirley. Um, I may have the wrong institution. Do you have uh, OT assistant and PT assistant programs at your school? Yes. So have you ever had any discussion about integrating those students and their faculty into your clinic, thinking about aging in place, health promotion and wellness initiatives, and all the things that those assistant students who will be licensed healthcare providers in the future might be able to offer your residents? Actually, we're, we're working on that right now as we speak. We have one of our DNP students who is uh, looking at developing her final DNP project to expand the clinic services to Tyler Towers, which is an elderly high rise for low income folks in um, Topeka. And that IPE team will include o OT and PT. Mm -hmm. It's amazing, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> We are speechless. Barbara? I'm thinking about crying. It's, I, the work you're doing is extraordinary. Um, we're, we're actually doing an evaluation of this program and really deep into it. One of the findings, and you don't even know this, um, but some of the work that you're doing, when you bring in something like business, they're like, huh, why are we here? So the struggles of really helping to, people mm -hmm. understand why they're brought, being brought into the team. But the other really strong finding is that these types of projects are as wonderful as, as they are, are actually having a bigger impact in the institution. It's opening up uh, relationships in the institution that's very different and much more lasting. So That has been really one of the benefits for me as a faculty member is to have those those experience occurring. We have people who are coming from various departments and saying, gosh, I just heard about this, tell me more. And so, that, for example, Dr. Rick Ellis wants to take all of the curriculum and embed it into his poverty studies program and so that we can collaborate more with that department as well. Uh, the School of Law was particularly interested and contacted uh, contacted me and asked how she could participate and so we're we're trying to figure out what that collaboration will look like and she has recently joined the clinics advisory council and her expertise is uh, housing disputes for um, those who live in poverty so uh, the, 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 it's just organically happening and so then a question I would kind of have for all of you is that how do the organizations that you represent support those innovations that are happening from the ground up uh, because they're risky. And so how do you support that risk? And you may not be able to answer that now, but I would really encourage you all to think about how you might help some of those grassroots organizations really get a foothold into something that's new and interesting and really just cool. We, we think this is replicable to other housing authorities across the nation. And, uh, but we'll see, we don't know yet, we're still new. Shirley, I just wanna commend you, and I know you have a lot of partners in this, but 
clearly you're a champion and a cheerleader. So how do you rate yourself on that um, scale of uh, most optimistic? Because you seem pretty positive about this. <laughs> well, I, I don't really, I'm just pathologically optimistic, which is different. Uh -huh. um, but I, I love the fact that uh, this is a model that could be used in other communities. Um, it certainly has applicability. I can, I, my head was popping thinking of, of areas in our state alone, you know, where we've tried some of this. My question to you is, uh, beyond the grant, um, what's the sustainability model? And I'm so pleased to hear you have the business school in there because they will really help you strategize about this. But um, for those of us in the room that might want to start something like this, um, what, what are some of your lessons learned around the financing of this? Financing is always hard. I think it's the biggest challenge that we all face in health care. Uh, even if we do have health insurance, we face that challenge. For us, the biggest challenge has really been about billing. And we, we do accept insurance, uh, but it took a long time to get everything approved through all of the... Uh, the correct folks and so one of our strategies now is to um, have a volunteer billing expert come in and help guide us on how to to bill at the level with which we need to bill most of us who who are volunteering or provide services there have purposely worked in uh, health care agencies where we didn't have to bill because billing's dumb um, but we really do know that uh, it's an important part of what we do to help us be sustainable. For those who don't have insurance, we have payment plans, but we don't refuse anybody for inability to pay. So we really use a combination of things from contributions, grants, billing, and um, self-pay when, when they can. And, re and really, uh, we are uh, Mary Tucker, who is the director of the Office of Sponsored Projects, also has an MBA, and so she is leading the advisory council and is, works with us very carefully uh, with the small uh, business development program on tracking our income on a real regular basis. So we've got lots of initiatives in place. Again, we're just still so new, we're not sure where we're going yet, but we fully fully believe that this clinic will be self-sustainable. And right now, they're getting no other monies from the, from the university. The only thing they get from the university is support and then the, the NPs volunteer time over at the clinic. Table four. That would be me, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I just wanted to say as a social worker, I just really want to commend you for the work you're doing in the, you know, in the housing authority and right in the community. So I was just curious, though, I mean, how much you're seeing that it's had an impact just on the, the community itself, you know, where the housing, uh, the public housing thing is and what, you know, do you see any involvement from them in terms of trying to sustain this also? And do you mean from the residents themselves? Yeah, the residents Yeah, themselves. that's a really good yeah. question because about a third to one half of the population turns over every year. And so uh, we have resident champions who have been there for a long time. And they, they have charged themselves with the task of making sure that all new folks who come into the neighborhood know about the clinic. And so uh, those folks who are there for the long haul are the folks who are championing these services all along the way. Uh, our new initiative uh, over at Tyler Towers, which is the elderly high rise, is going to be led by a resident liaison who's going to bring everybody down to the monthly resident meeting to let them know about the clinic and bringing health care services to the towers instead of them having to come to the clinic. Uh, I think there's, there's very active involvement, and part of that is because of two things. One is that uh, the mission of THA is to treat everybody with dignity and respect, and I think residents learn that when they've been there even for a short time. And then the other thing is that the faculty who have been involved in the C2C project all along the way, we are there and we are committed. We go to the preschool, the preschool graduations. We go to the open houses when it's like the wind chill of 15 below, which we did last week. We attend all of those activities because we want folks to understand that we are committed to them just as they are committed to themselves. And between the two groups together, I think we'll form a, a much stronger union to make this a, a, a living, breathing experience. 
Table two. Yeah, um, this is this is a great thing. It really reminds me of this, the school-based healthcare things that we do. Um, the one concern I have about um, the impact on the learners' attitudes about what healthcare sometimes should be about. Like the only way poor people get healthcare is if we give it to them. Like that, it tells them that it's, there's a there's a there's a there is a um, there is a, a tiers of healthcare. Like like you know they'll go to the the people with money will go to the shiny hospital. They have to, the people in the housing authority need to have faculty members volunteer their time to take care of them. And and the one concern I have is that does it build? Do you have to like intentionally work with your students to to really battle that stigma and battle that mindset, saying that like you know because because you want to make it sustainable down the line. You you'd love for like a that to become a real functioning clinic. Someday, I would hope, and so my my feeling is is that sometimes there's like, well, you know, we're we're doing moving all these mountains to get this done, for the for, but in the reality is they should be being treated like everybody else, you know, and I think that's 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 a that we deal with that with that school based healthcare center too. That's a dichotomy we have that we need to be there where the care is needed, but. It also sends a message to our students is that there's kind of two health systems. There's the, the ones that people have insurance and money and all those kind of things like that. And the other one has to rely on these, these you know, people volunteering their time and doing all those, those types of things like that. So do you encounter that with your students at all when, you, uh, when, when, you're, when you're debriefing and having conversations and those types of things like that? Absolutely. Uh, we don't support academic tourism. And we, one of our modules addresses that content, and students have to have that content before they're allowed to have their clinical experiences there. The other thing is, is that we really are a full functioning clinic already. Uh, it's too early to tell if we're going to be sustainable for 20 years from now, but right now we're pretty sustainable. Um, and um, the other piece that I think about, that, that dichotomy in healthcare, we already have that. So we're not going to pretend like it doesn't exist because we have it. So my friend, Dr. Lori Edwards, uh, told this story one time that she was on this camping trip with her church group, and there was a big storm, and they were ca uh, canoeing, and so they had to portage their canoes for a while. And so she put a backpack on her front and a backpack on her back and started hiking down to the camp where the guys were going to lift up the canoes and carry the canoes and do all that. Well, she came on the path, a log that had been blown down, a tree had been blown down overnight, and so she took her backpack back off, took the other one off, climbed over, threw them over, put them back on, and hiked all the way down. And she was exhausted from that experience. And so when her, her friends came along who were carrying the canoes, she says, gosh, was it hard getting those canoes over that log? And they said, no, we just walked around it. And so that has been kind of our strategy all along. Health care is really hard for many, many people, so let's walk around it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've decided to do with this clinic. One of the things that I've seen is the startup of these amazing projects like you're doing and that they become the, the best hidden secret within colleges and universities and they don't get mainstreamed. And when the champions and the optimists leave or get exhausted, they don't have the infrastructure to continue. Mm -hmm. how, how are you dealing with that? That's a really great, great question. And from the curriculum end, we've already embedded this curriculum pieces into the existing curriculum. So unless somebody really doesn't think this is an important part of curriculum anymore, uh, faculty own the curriculum so they can change that as they wish. As far as the clinic itself is concerned, it's not run by Washburn. It is run by Topeka Housing Authority, and they have full authority and responsibility 
to make that continuation happen, collaborating with whomever they want to collaborate. Fortunately for us, they've chosen us to continue that collaboration. So I do have to say I was P I'm PI of this particular grant, and as, as the grant was winding down and as the clinic was becoming sustainable and I didn't need to be there very often, I really had some separation anxiety about leaving this clinic. And so I'm really thinking we're not going to have too many people abandon this clinic. I think we're all going to feel a little bit separation anxiety as we continue to move away into or retire or, or those kinds of things. But we've also built it into the other grants that we have uh, recently been awarded. We have a rural health grant for NP education, and part of that rural health also includes those who are medically underserved. So students rotate through Pine Ridge Family, uh, Family Health Center in addition to their rural health experiences. And again, like I said, we have a, a, re a new grant where we're going to um, have RN students go to uh, ambulatory care centers instead of acute care, so they'll be rotating through that grant as well. And I think, again, because it's so embedded in the curriculum that that piece of it will be successful. Malcolm? So, so we, we've heard, and this is really a question for, for both groups, we, we've heard a great deal uh, about some great innovations. Uh, that you've developed on a shoestring, basically, from concept to actual operation, which is terrific, and I commend you for that. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering to what degree you have worked within your associations, by which I mean, and I don't know their titles, the Association of Correctional Institutions mm -hmm. and the Association of Public Housing. Mm -hmm. But th there are many such groups, I'm sure, in both areas. To what degree are you getting policy support and interest from those various groups, if they exist, which I imagine they must? So for corrections, um, California Corrections is the only correctional uh, prison system in California. There are a lot of jails there, and they, we have jail corrections. Um, we have not partnered with them on this initiative, but I will tell you that the support we're getting is coming from the Board of Registered Nurses and the community colleges. And so our partnerships are really at that level right now. And I believe once we um, develop a, a sustainable program and we really get this dialed in, then we can move forward and try and engage the other correctional partners. At least the other states, they've presumably... Mm -hmm. you know, four dozen or more other states. It's, I mean, California is important, but it's not the only state in the country. Well. And you, and <laughs> <laughs> just a little challenge there. No, but I mean, it does, it does really help. And, mm -hmm. and the academic community lobbies intensively through its associations. Mm -hmm. And so I think looking at national associations mm -hmm. uh, at the right time, and I don't know what that is, obviously. Mm -hmm. That's for you folks to decide. But it really is one way of, 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 of stimulating interest and support for your own project, mm -hmm. as well as disseminating the idea in a more scalable fashion across the country. Great idea. Yeah, that's, thank, you. thank you. And, and I wondered about the Public Housing Association. As well. well, for public housing, Trey has already presented this nationally a couple of times now, and so he's taking this design to his professional organizations, Trey George's. And as far as nursing is concerned, there are probably half the people in this room who could speak to nursing competencies and nurse practitioner competencies and in, in, in how they are really mandated and should be to supporting care in diverse populations and in diverse settings. And so I think nursing has been behind this forever. And now getting, I don't know what we'll do about School of Business and School of Law and, and communications, but I do know the School of Law is very invested in addressing social determinants of health and how the, the legal world uh, impacts social determinants of health. So uh, that's a good question that I'll take back to our, our partners. And also of, of training sites. I mean, certainly within nursing, a big problem is the lack of training sites. And, right. and that extends, I think, to many health professions. And you have, you know, a thousand bed hospital that's currently excluded from the system in California. Uh, just think of the training sites nationally mm -hmm. that, that, that could deal with that problem in nursing. And I'm sure it's true in many other professions as well. 
uh, the competition for training sites is increasingly intense and to have uh, uh, potential training sites that are not being utilized is a crying shame if not a criminal shame. Malcolm, thank you for transitioning, transitioning us to um, open panel questions. So, Barbara, no? <laughs> You've made me think about licensing examinations and their strengths and their limitations, all of you, and I heard that this morning as well. And it, it seems to me I have absolutely no idea, other than in nursing, how, our, how licensing exams influence the nature of practice. So I'd, I'd be real interested in that. But for Barbara and Jane, you mentioned that that became a barrier in terms of being able to use your own organization. So if you could rule the universe, what would you do, and you know, I don't want to focus specifically on NCLEX, but that's your reality, is there seems to be an assumption here that the competencies for ambulatory care for community are not exactly the same as acute care and that we are not testing for them. So if you could do anything you wanted in the universe, what would you do about that? Well, I think first we have to get rid of that assumption. Um, we assume because acute care nursing has always been sort of the bedrock of nursing school, that that's where you have to start. And I was one of those clinical leaders that believed I really wanted my nurses to have some type of medical surgical training or acute care training before I hired them. But now that's not the direction that we're going in. Now we have patients that are being treated in clinics. As a transplant manager, when I first started transplant, our patients stayed in 10 to 14 days after a kidney transplant. When I left 10 years ago, we discharged them after two or three days. Um, so times have changed. And if I had a magic wand, I would wave it over the board of registered nurses so that they could understand that the way nurses are educated now really should land in the hand of all of our academic partners and uh, executives at the hospital coming together and saying, what is it we want to train our nurses on? Um, Jane and I are embarking on a huge project for a substance use disorder, and yet that's not a huge part of our training, and that's all we hear about is opioid addiction. Our nurses need to be trained on that. Nurses weren't trained on electronic records, and now they are. That's a standard part. So just keeping up with the time and understanding that healthcare is changing. It's not the healthcare that I first started in the 80s with, um, Jane in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to point that out because I'm getting old. <laughs> we have the 60s. <laughs> we do indeed. <laughs> But the point is, is that the decisions have to, to change. They, the owners of the decision really need to be, as we should say in shared governance for nursing, it should be at that point of care. And right now, I don't believe the folks making the decisions about the NCLEX are necessarily at the point of care. I don't, I don't know that they are feeling our pain. Um, and so if I had that one, that's what I would do. That, you know, that's a, that's a really great question, and, and it's always, you know, the thing you wish is also the thing you dread, right? So you give me a wand, and I'm going to wave it, and all sorts of ma magical, wonderful things are going to happen, and then the terrible things happen, too. So, you know, for me, I think um, if we think about all of the state agencies and the federal agencies, and I think you, you brought up an excellent point about our other partners in, in correctional health care, there is the federal government, there are the state governments. Barbara, you mentioned we have jails which are operated by cities and counties. And every single regulation that goes into what the Board of Registered Nurses or any other board has to deal with take years mm -hmm. to undo or redo or layer over. And that's a huge thing to think about. 
I can't just wave this wand. It's a very slow moving wand and it has a lot of impact to a lot mm -hmm. of different folks. I think that it's no longer a balanced education. Um, and that is what I would ask for. I would ask for a balanced education that meets the needs of the patients, all of the purveyors of care, I can't think of it in any other terms, and, and the patients. Not everybody is going to go after that bachelor's degree in nursing. I'm sorry to say they're not. They're looking for something that they love and they feel passionate about and that makes a difference in their community. And if that's an, a licensed vocational nurse, I need to have the ability to celebrate that. And I also need to be able to celebrate any advancement that folks and you know hold that to change regulations is so cumbersome. Mm -hmm. I want our nurses to be able to have the same attraction to ambulatory care as to the ICU. And that so, we have a long way to go before we get that, you know, really magic. Nurses want to be technicians when they first come out. They want to do those IVs. They want to partner with that, you know, heart transplant team. That's really exciting and you're brushing elbows with really exciting state-of-the-art people it's very boring so i'm right? gonna have to cut this off oh, because you. we're a little bit past our <laughs> time you. uh and much. i want to thank the panel for this very informative session